If the police have no duty to protect you, then why do taxpayers support the police? The reality is always cruel. In the United States, the police only protect the people, not the individuals. Today, we start from the movie The Pig, The Snake, and The Pigeon, and use the principle of economic analysis of law to talk about why the American justice, the police only have the responsibility to catch criminals after the crime, but do not have the obligation to protect you before the crime and during the case. Please follow me and subscribe to my channel. I'm eager to discuss ideas and reality with you and uncover the untold secrets. Economics is so cold that it doesn't have an ounce of warmth for personal preferences, let alone for morality. The core principle of economics is that everything has a cost. So does justice, or to be precise, the realization of justice, also have a cost. This raises a very real and brutal question for us. If you can pay the cost of justice, will justice leave you? Miriam Douglas and her four-year-old daughter lived on the second floor of a shared house at 1112 Lamont Street Northwest in the District of Columbia. Carolyn Warren and Joan Taliaferro lived on the third floor. In the early morning of Sunday, March 16, 1975, two men, Marvin Kent and James Morse, broke into the room. Kent forced Douglas to perform moral sex on him, and Morse then raped her. Warren and Talia Farrow heard cries for help coming from downstairs, and Warren called 911. The operator told her to be quiet and assured her that the police would immediately go to assist. Metropolitan Police Department headquarters logged a burglary reported by Warren at 623 them. Officers patrolling Main Street were notified at 626. Four cruisers responded to the broadcast, three of which went to Lamont Street. After making the phone call, Warren and Talia Farrow climbed through a window onto an adjacent roof and waited for the police to arrive. There, they saw one police officer drive through the alley behind their house and drive all the way to the front of the residence without stopping or peeking out the window to inspect. A second officer knocked on the front door but left without receiving a response. At 6.33 them, all three officers left the scene five minutes after their arrival. Warren and Talia Farrow returned to the room. They heard Douglas' persistent screams and called the police again. The police again assured them that help was on the way. The second call received at 6.42 them was recorded as simply investigating trouble, so no police responded at all. Thinking that the police would arrive soon, Warren and Talia Farrow called for Douglas, presumably also trying to scare off the intruders. After finding them both, the intruders, Kent and Morse, forced the three women at knife point to go with them to Kent's apartment. Over the next 14 hours, the captive women were robbed, beaten, and forced to accept sexual favors from Kent and Morse. After the incident, Warren, Talia Farrow, and Douglas sued the District of Columbia and the Metropolitan Police Department for negligence. But the trial court ruled against them. They again took their lawsuit to the Court of Appeals and ultimately the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. In a 4-3 to three decision, upheld the trial court's judgment based on the public duty doctrine, which ruled that the duty to provide public services is owed to the public at large and absent a special relationship between the police and an individual. No specific legal duty exists. Chinese people should be particularly familiar with this ruling, which means we serve the people, not you. Due to the case law adopted by the United States, this precedent has far-reaching effects and directly influenced another judgment. That is, in 1999. Simon shot three daughters of his and Jessica. Jessica Linehan Gonzalez, a resident of Castle Rock, Colorado, filed for a mandatory restraining order against her husband, Simon, 
during their divorce proceedings. On June 4, 1999, the permanent restraining order was granted, which provided that Simon was prohibited from coming within 100 yards, 91 meters, of one of Jessica's sons and three of her daughters outside of designated visitation hours. On June 22, at approximately 5.15 p.m., Simon removed the three girls in violation of the order. Jessica called the police at 7.30 p.m., 8.30 p.m., and 10.10 p.m. on June 22 and at about 0.15 a.m. on June 23. She went to the police station in person at 0.40 a.m. on June 23. No action was taken by the police. At approximately 3.20 a.m. on June 23, Simon appeared at the Castle Rock Police Department and was killed in a shootout with police. During a search of his vehicle, the police officers found the bodies of his three daughters and determined that three daughters had been killed before arriving at the police station. The police did not find a cause of death and could not confirm the time and place of death. Gonzalez sued the city of Castle Rock, Colorado, the city's police department, and three police officers with whom she had spoken in the United States District Court, pursuant to 42 U.S.C. A. 1983, claiming a federally protected property interest in the enforcement of the restraining order and alleging that an official policy or custom of failing to respond properly to complaints of restraining order violations. This suit went all the way to the Court of Appeals before losing anyway. Justice David Souter wrote a concurring opinion on the grounds that enforcement of a restraining order is a process, not the interests protected by the process, and that there is not due process protection for processes. The case eventually reached the U.S. Supreme Court six years later. In the end, the Supreme Court ruled against Jessica by an overwhelming 8 to 1 margin on the grounds that the police have no affirmative constitutional duty to protect the personal property of a citizen unless a special custodial relationship exists between the two. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, who authored the Supreme Court's decision, insisted that the spirit of the Constitution is in its text and that there is no positive language prescribing governmental action or implying any positive civil rights. According to the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. According to Scalia, this phrase uses negative words such as not and deny without any positive language specifying what duties the government should have. Therefore, the amendment can be interpreted as no duty to protect, no duty to protect states to American citizens that fundamental principle of American law that a government and its agents are under no general duty to provide public services, such as police protection, to any individual citizen. In 2011, the lawsuit was submitted to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, IACR, which is composed of representatives of members of the Organization of American States. The United States became a full member by ratifying a charter document, which is itself a treaty. Ultimately, the Commission found that the state failed to act with due diligence to protect Jessica Linehan and her daughters, Leslie, Catherine, and Rebecca Gonzalez from domestic violence, which violated the state's obligation not to discriminate and to provide for equal protection before the law. The Commission also stated that the failure of the United States to adequately organize its state structure to protect the Gonzalez girls from domestic violence was discriminatory and constituted a violation of their right to life.
The principle of no duty to protect declares that the government is not the enforcer of justice, but the final arbiter of litigation and equity. The government does not actively intervene in any action between individuals, but only adjudicates when an individual files a lawsuit. In the case of the police, their duty is not to prevent crime, but to apprehend criminals after a crime and commit them to the court. The government is an enforcer of judgments, but even then, it is not an active enforcer of all judgments, such as mandatory restraining orders. If you see a police officer on the street, grinning as he watches two suspects shooting at each other, it's like watching a blockbuster shootout. Until one of them goes down, he smirks and says to the other one, please put your hands up. This is really legal in America. That's why Americans say, you have to be a ward of the state for them to be your bodyguards. No duty to protect is only a principle of American law not of the laws of other countries. In the vast majority of countries in the world, including Europe, Asia, and so on, the law provides that the police have a duty to protect the property and lives of citizens. Even in the UK, the progenitor of case law, there is a duty on the police to protect the public and prevent crime. Crime prevention is a positive duty. In Scotland, it is laid down pretty clearly in Section 20 of the Police and Fire Reform, Scotland Act 2012, subsection 1, c. 1. It is the duty of a constable, a. to prevent and detect crime, b. to maintain order, c. to protect life and property, d. to take such lawful measures and make such reports to the appropriate prosecutor, as may be needed to bring offenders with all due speed to justice, e. where required to serve and execute a warrant, citation or deliverance issued, or process duly endorsed by a Lord Commissioner of Justiciary, Sheriff, Summary Sheriff for Justice of the Peace, in relation to criminal proceedings, and f. to attend court to give evidence. One of the major reasons for the principle of no duty to protect in the United States, law is the cost of law enforcement. As we all know, the law is universally applicable, and no exceptions should be made for individual cases. The police will have multiple considerations in every execution of their duties, the most important of which is the protection of their own personal safety. Their judgment of the real situation at the scene also varies from person to person. This leads to the fact that when carrying out their duties, the police will decide on actions according to their own discretion, and these actions will certainly lead to different results. If a lawsuit is brought against the police simply because of the difference in passable outcomes, the police and the government will be sued into bankruptcy. In Simon's suit in 1999, the plaintiffs demanded damages amounting to use $30 million. In addition, if such a lawsuit is allowed, the United States government will be forced to devote a great deal of human and financial resources to dealing with judicial proceedings. At the same time, the legal and moral risks borne by the police are so great that no one would be willing to take on this responsibility which would result in no one wanting to be a police officer. The law is always a holistic system, so it is difficult to make comparisons between different countries regarding separate legal provisions. The Chinese government, for example, has adopted the principle of positive protection. This is based on the fact that it is very difficult for individuals to bring lawsuits against the government and claim compensation. For Chinese citizens, the cost is too high, and even if they win, the amount of compensation, benefits, is too small. The opposite is true in the United States. Justice has a cost. Reducing the cost of justice is an essential issue in the law, making process, but never publicized in the law. Justice that can pay its costs can be achieved. It's only justice on paper, Justice delayed is justice denied, 
injustice that cannot be paid its price either. Then, how to build a justice-oriented society as far as possible becomes a problem that every individual has to face. The justice society here includes not only the government, but also each individual. Three several principles to build up as completely as possible justice system. So far, the market-based solution of justice is probably the most efficient one that human beings can find. The marketization of justice means that, as far as possible, the market will make available to each individual a hierarchical and diverse range of options for the implementation of justice. It is up to each individual to make his or her own choices. This includes bounty hunters who offer their services privately, class action lawsuits to reduce costs, individual gun ownership, and even the private law practice of Arauchi, meaning vendetta in Japanese. I'd rather rely on my 1911 than trust my life to 911. In ancient times, private vengeance, carried out by blood relatives of the victim, existed all over the world. This form of revenge was legal in many countries and regions. In Japan, vengeance was institutionalized in the Edo period. Not only the blood relatives of the victim, but also masters and servants, such as the samurai of the daimyo, could take revenge for the daimyo. The legislation of the Edo shogunate provided that the perpetrator of a murder was to be punished by the public authorities the shogunate and the clan. However, if the perpetrator disappeared and the public authorities were unable to punish him, retaliation was permitted by interesting the punishment to the victim's relatives. It is also prohibited for those who have been killed in a vendetta to engage in counter-vendetta. On February 14, 1984, Jeffrey Dusit, a 25-year-old karate instructor, kidnapped a student, 11-year-old Jody, and took him to a motel in Anaheim, California, where he sexually assaulted and molested him. Then Dusit allowed the boy to make collect calls to his mother from the motel. So California police raided the motel and arrested Dusit on February 29. It was only afterward that it was learned that Dusit had been sexually abusing the boy for at least a year. On March 16, 1984, Dusit was flown back to Louisiana for trial. He arrived at Baton Rouge Metropolitan Airport around 9.30 p.m. and was led through the airport by police in handcuffs. Judy's father, Leon Gary Plotch, was talking to a close friend in front of her out payphones at this time. And as Dusit passed by, Plotch drew his gun and fired, killing the child rapist, Dusit. Instantly, Plotch was sentenced in 1989 to seven years suspended sentence, with five years probation and 300 hours of community service. A similar case occurred in Germany on May 5, 1980, when seven-year-old Anna, after an argument with her mother, Marianne Bachmeier, skipped school. She was kidnapped and sexually assaulted by her neighbor, 35-year-old butcher Klaus Grabowski, who eventually strangled Anna with a pair of his fiancée's tights. On March 6, 1981, at about 10 o'clock, the third day of the trial, Bachmeier fired seven shots, six of which struck Grabowski, killing him in courtroom 157 of the Lübeck District Court. On November 2, 1982, Bachmeier was charged in court with murder. On March 2, 1983, she was convicted by the Circuit Court Chamber of the District Court of Lübeck of manslaughter and unlawful possession of a weapon and sentenced to six years imprisonment for the combination of these two charges. Bachmeier was released after serving three years of her sentence. Although the laws of contemporary countries do not support vendettas, the results of the above two judgments, both of which were lenient, indirectly recognized the justice of vendettas. The Adao Chi, vendetta, itself, 
is a way to reduce the cost of law enforcement to the government. Although the criminals in both cases have been arrested, the subsequent trial, incarceration, and recidivism costs associated with being released are enormous. One of them, Grabowski, was sentenced to chemical castration for sexually assaulting two girls prior to the Enna case. However, he later underwent hormone therapy privately in order to reverse the castration. In the United States, a bounty hunter is a private agent who works for a bail bondsman to capture fugitives or criminals for a commission or bounty. The official name of this profession is bail enforcement agent or fugitive pursuit agent. So, can a bounty hunter represent a fugitive? The American movie True Grit depicts the story of Maddie Ross, a 14-year-old girl who hires Rooster Cogburn to avenge her father's death. Of course, the movie reacts to the Western era of the United States over a hundred years ago. Today, few countries in the world support vendettas because private law will undermine the principle of justice. Justice without trial undermines justice itself. Governments are necessarily inefficient, and police enforcement prioritizes the police's own interests. Citizens, on the other hand, must pay the cost of obtaining justice. If individuals cannot afford to pay the cost of justice, then justice is only paper justice. Therefore, how to establish an efficient social justice system has always troubled human beings. In all these cases, we can only hope for the gradual improvement of a self-generated and spontaneous order by social evolution. Please follow me and share my video. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel so we can work together to uncover the hidden truths of our society on ideas and reality. We can also explore the mysterious perceptions of ancient human beings and ideas and myths together. Life is beautiful, but with all the beauty, someone is paying the price.